Uh, yes, so I'll talk about the optimality of local algorithms for inference on amenable graphs, and this is uh, joint work with Andrea Montanari. Uh, here's the archive link if you want to check out the paper, and okay, let's go in it. So I'll be discussing uh, the main motivation here is to understand the computational tractability of optimal statistical estimation in general. So there is an immense literature on mean field models or exchangeable graphical models, and by mean, you'll understand progressively what I mean by mean field here. But exchangeable, so we've heard this word yesterday from Chandra's talk, and those are distributions where when you look at the variables, then you can exchange them and that doesn't change the joint distribution. And in the study of these mean field models, there is a ubiquitous phenomenon that has emerged, which is the information computation gap. What is that? That's a regime in terms of the SNR, in terms of the signal strength of the problem or the noise of the problem, where estimation is information theoretically possible if you had all the computation in the universe, but it is very, very much computationally hard. If you restrict yourself to efficient algorithms, then you cannot reach the optimal performance. So that's, this has been noticed, this is now very famous and there are hundreds of papers on it. So what is this information computation gap? How do we explain it? There is an emerging picture for rationalizing this phenomenon and many people have, have contributed here. So this is just a partial list. And so from the physics side, or the statistical physics side, this is rationalized by saying that there exist in the free energy landscape of the problems, there are barriers, for instance, you have an energy landscape, you're here, you're doing your local search, and the solution is here, and to go from here to here, you have to climb a mountain of energy. And you can't do that in finite time or in, in less than exponential time. So this is rough, and here are some references if you want to look this up. This, these are the physics uh, explanations, and here there are some rigorous results on spin glasses. The overlap gap property, to which David Gomarnik from here have uh, contributed, and Andrea as well, uh, says basically that suppose you have a signal and you're trying to uh, find the signal in this noisy instance, you look at the inner product of your signal with the current iterate of your algorithm, let's say, and there are only a few values of the over overlap that are allowed. There is a jump between, for instance, if you sample two uh, independent samples from the posterior distribution of your, of your problem, then either you'll find two values basically, either your, your two samples are orthogonal or they're almost identically the same. And there is a gap between zero and one. And that's often uh, taken as a rationale for why the problem is hard because you can't do that jump in finite time. Okay, so there is an immense literature on sum of squares algorithm which is a paradigm based on semi-definite programming, I won't go into it. And I'm gonna be talking mostly about local algorithms and belief propagation. There are also, um, this emerging notion that is called the low degree likelihood ratio method, which is just if you suppose you have a hypothesis testing problem, a binary hypothesis testing problem, you can compute your likelihood ratio that usually you can't compute in polynomial time in general. So what you can do is you can just project it on low degree functions, low degree polynomials for instance, and that's efficiently computable. Turns out that this is an indicator of whether, so if this estimator works, then polynomial, obviously polynomial time algorithm works because this is a polynomial time algorithm. And if it fails, then it is taken as an evidence that nothing can work. And I think Alex Wine will talk a little bit about this in his talk. And finally, there are these things called average case reductions, which are, which are very different from worst case reductions. And this is mostly the work of uh, Guy Bressler and students from MIT, and they've been doing some fantastic work on this on this front. So I'll be focusing on the local algorithms in this talk. So before doing that, and before talking about the main point, okay. So one one other thing that I forgot is it is unclear how these uh, all these competing notions and rationalizations relate to the, to each other. This is it's very much an open problem. How to say when when this predicts that the problem should be hard, why this should predict that the problem be hard, etc. Okay, so as I said, this problem has been observed in meat field type models. So examples of that are sparse or dense, dense Erdős-Rényi graphs, random regular graphs, the complete graph, dense factor graphs, etc. And these, the, they have a common thread. These all, mo all these models are highly exchangeable. So what about models with more structures, or with more structure or lesser degree of exchangeability? 
So before going uh, into the actual crux of the problem, let me just give you a very simple computation. If you haven't seen this, well, you're gonna see it today. It's really simple. I'm gonna consider the easing model. Where, where is it? Uh, yeah, easing model on the lattice versus the tree, and I'm gonna compute the free energy difference of two configurations. Suppose you have a set S, and this is inside a giant box box in the lattice or the tree in general, in the, in the tree case. And the first configuration is a plus everywhere. And the second configuration is a plus here and a minus inside. So in the lattice, so what is the energy cost? So to remind you, this is the, the Gibbs measure. What is the energy cost of flipping mine all the pluses to minuses here is just the boundary term because agreeing terms here don't contribute, agreeing terms here don't contribute. The only thing that contributes to the difference is these edges that are violated. And that's the size of the, of the, of the boundary of this set in finite dimension or in the lattice. That's just proportional to this term. If you take, let's say this is a box in the lattice and its side length is L, this is what you get, okay? If you're in the tree, then it's the same thing. It's the size of the boundary, but because of the, tr the, the tree expands, this is larger than some constant times the volume, and that's n. Now the number, let's look at the entropy now. The number of such boxes in, in the lattice is just L to the P because you can take this set and translate it everywhere. And that's proportional to n. On the other hand, on the tree, you can think, take, take any subset of points that are that have size s, and that's, I mean, everything is allowed, so it's n choose s, which is exponential in n. So what is the free energy difference? To remind, me, to remind you of your thermodynamics, the free energy is just the energy minus temperature times the entropy, or if you can divide by t and put the beta here. And you take this term and you uh, subtract the, lo the logarithm of this term, so you get this much. So this is the leading term and it's sublinear. It's d minus one over d. On the other hand, for the tree, it's linear because you have an exponential, uh, no, so because you have this term. The energy is linear in n. So you see now that the free energy difference between these two configurations, in one hand, it is sublinear, in the other, in, in the, other the tree case, it is linear. So here it's much smaller. So if you divide, divide by n, this will go to zero. If you divide by n, that will be a constant. So that's a qualitative difference that you'll see uh, between the tree and the lattice. So what is the key factor here that changed, that, that made this difference is the fact that the tree expands and the lattice does not expand, okay? Now keep that as a side note and we're gonna see that this is a crucial phenomenon that happens in full generality. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears. I'm gonna talk about the general setting. So I finished talking about the, the, the heuristics. My setting is the following. I have a graph on n vertices. I have random variables that are drawn uniformly from a finite alphabet. And what I observe, so these random variables are hidden from me. And what I observe is on every edge of this graph, I observe a random variable that depends on the endpoints of the of the of that edge, depending probabilistically, meaning this is drawn from some kernel that depends on theta u and theta v. And I'm going to allow myself a little bit more slack. I'm going to add some side information. This is for technical reasons. For every vertex independently, I'll allow you to see the actual value of theta u with probability epsilon, and I don't give you anything with probability one minus epsilon. So what is my goal? So this is my information. I get to see this and I get to see that. How uh, the E ends, this, this E n. So this is a fixed sequence of graphs that, I, that you know. You know it. And uh, the goal is to estimate these hidden ra random variables with performance that is strictly positive uniformly as epsilon goes to zero. This is my goal because, okay, so we can game the system and throw away these guys and just consider the side information, but this cannot possibly be, be true. So this is just to help you a little bit, but not too much. Yes, that's right. So I'll phrase it in that way in a second. 
So examples, so we can consider what, what kind of channels Q could you have. So we could consider a compact group, um, I mean Z, Z2, Z over 2Z or Z over QZ for instance, and you can draw theta, theta U's from the uniform measure on that group, and then you can do for every edge, you observe the difference between them with probability one minus P, or I give you noise with probability P, that one that's one possibility. This is called group synchronization. Community detection and planted clique. In this case, the graph is the complete graph, and the UV just encodes the adjacency structure of your random graph that is planted, has a clique in it, or whatnot. Okay. Um, these are more dense models. Okay, so the graph also here is dense for the spike Wigner or Wishart, and you observe something that looks like this. So you have theta u times theta v plus some Gaussian noise, and this is IID the teras or some IID from, from some distribution that you can quantize if you want to make it fit in the model because I said that alpha bit is finite. Okay. So my measure of performance is the following. So I give you a function f that goes from the alpha bit to the reals. I can construct this matrix, f theta u, f theta v. And I want to minimize the square loss. Okay. So the base optimal estimator is just the posterior. And here by yg, Epsilon, I mean the union of the y's and the size, the side information that depends on epsilon. Okay. So here's the general result. If your sequence of graphs converges locally weakly to an infinite random rooted graph, GO, which is amenable almost surely, then there exists a sequence of estimators that are indexed by L, this integer L that have runtime basically O of n squared, which is basically just the time it takes you to fill out that matrix. So that's such that for every L and for almost every epsilon, this is the side information, you, your risk uh, using this estimator is uh, close to the base risk as n goes to infinity and then you let L go to infinity. So this is the main result. Right, so okay, I didn't define what locally weekly means, I didn't define what amenable means, and I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes discussing those. Okay. So this result doesn't depend on doesn't depend on anything. This the arbitrary channel can be anything. And what is this algorithm? This algorithm is computable by a local algorithm, and it's very simple. We just look at the posterior distribution of f theta u given a ball around u of fixed size L. And you multiply by the same thing for v. So that's my algorithm, that's it. So as long as L is finite, you can compute this in finite time, in, uh, in constant time, excuse me. And if, uh, okay, if the graph has, has a, a fixed degree, let's say it's, is, uh, is uh, locally finite, if every vertex has finite degree, then this is computable in constant time for every UV, and then that's hence the, the runtime n squared. Okay. Uh, it could be as bad as exponential. But it, so far, I can't I can't tell you anything about the dependence on L. It could be as bad as exponential. Yes. Yes, that's right. So that will be one of the next comments here. So what are the remarks? So, so the base optimal estimation is efficiently possible on asymptotically amenable graphs with almost no further assumptions. There are no assumptions there. Okay, so this comes actually from a more fundamental fact, which is that computing the marginals is easy on such graphs. On amenable graphs, computing the marginals is easy. And how easy it is, is just you look at a ball around you of fixed size and that will be a good approximation. Okay, so compare your estimator. So this is our estimator to the Bayes optimal estimator. Here you see I've decoupled theta u and theta v. So here they're, they're acting independently where here I need to, to uh, estimate their joint expectation. And for a large graph, typically u and v will be very, very far apart. So how can you reduce estimating the synchronization or the relative uh, difference, let's say, between theta u and theta v, where they're very far by a local algorithm. How does that make sense? This is actually, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, a consequence of introducing side information, is that conditionally on the information that you've seen, things become independent, and you will see that in the proof. This is a crucial fact in the proof. 
Okay, so okay, so as uh, the rubber had said, this this suggests that this matrix is approximately rank one, and this is indeed true because of side information. Actually, it is more general than that. This matrix is just generally rank one at, under minimal conditions. Okay, so let me discuss the what, it, what what do I mean by locally weakly, and what do I mean by amenable? Yeah. For Z2 on the lattice, for instance, no. So this, I'm considering amenable graphs, so they're not trees. So that was known for the tree, so the particular example that you, that you said was known for the tree, so you can do belief propagation, and that's fine. Uh, on any other type of graphs, not that I know of. So, okay, so the motivation, we were studying the lattice. Initially, we're, okay, let's move out away from mean field, let's study uh, more, more structured problems. We were studying the lattice, and then we discovered that this doesn't depend on the lattice. This is just a general fact. Okay, okay, so, um, Tamara yesterday talked briefly about graphons and how they arise as limits of uh, dense graphs. I'll give you another notion of a graph limit that is called the Dunning-Minishram limit. And this is uh, specially designed to handle sparse graphs. And I think we're gonna also hear about sparse graphs from Jennifer and, and uh, Christian. So the definition is, so for a sequence, let me define the benjamin Schramm topology. A sequence of rooted graph, what do I mean by a rooted graph? You take a graph and you choose a vertex from the graph and that will be a rooted graph, that's it. A sequence of rooted graphs converges locally to a rooted graph geo if for every fixed radius, the ball of radius R around O n in G n is isomorphic to the ball around O of radius R in G. And by isomorphic, I mean a bijection that preserves edges and that sends the roots to the roots. That's what I mean by isomorphic in the sense of rooted graph. So this defines a topology on, on rooted graphs and I can put probability measures on them. Okay, just a remark here, if the graph is finite and connected, then I can, can create a random rooted graph geo just by choosing the root uniformly at random from the set of vertices, okay? Now, my second definition is the following. A sequence of finite graph G and converges locally weakly to a random rooted graph G O, and I'm gonna denote its uh, distribution by rho. If G N O N, where O N is chosen uniformly from the set of vertices of G N, converges in distribution to G O. What does that mean? It means that for every given any fixed connected graph, rooted graph H O prime, and every radius R, the probability that this graph is isomorphic to this graph converges to the probability in the limit of the limiting graph being isomorphic to H. Okay, please ask questions if this is not clear. This is like, th this will be fundamental. So remark, uh, remarks about local weak convergence, this, so this topology is specially designed to carry local information about the graph neighborhoods, okay? So this is how I defined it. It turns out to be equivalent to the notion of left convergence, which is based on counting homomorphisms from uh, the graph to a smaller graph. Um, I won't much elaborate on this, maybe the uh, speakers will elaborate on that in the, in the afternoon. As I set it up, it's apparently weak. Okay, I'm just caring about local neighborhoods, but it turns out that a surprisingly large number of observables are continuous in this topology. So it's so weak that you might think a priori that nothing should be, nothing non-trivial should be continuous in this topology, but that's not true. A ton of observables are continuous. So let me give you some examples about what converges to what. If you look at a finite box in the grid, that will converge to the entire grid rooted at the origin. If you look at a random regular graph on, D ver on n vertices and degree b, that will converge to the regular tree, the infinite regular tree that has a root that is arbitrary because the tree is transitive. Now if I consider a sparse Erdős-Renyi graph, which is a graph on n vertices where you put an edge independently with probability c over n or b over n, so that the average degree is B. Then com that converges to an object that is called the Poisson Galton Watson tree, which is that every node you generate a Poisson D 
of springs and you keep recursing. And okay, so this is a more uh, peculiar example. If you look at the complete graph and you put the uniform measure on the set of spanning trees of that, gra of that graph, so this is a random, ra random graph, and you put the uniform measure of very roots, then that converges to what's called the infinite skeleton tree, and that's this, that's just a graph that goes on Z plus. Dot, 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 and on every uh, integer, you generate a Poisson Galton Watson tree with uh, mean one, which is critical. Okay, PGW. Dot, 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 and these are independent. Anyway, this is a peculiar example. And um, you can take your favorite sequence of sparse graphs that will have a limit or at least subsequentially. So this is really weak. So an important uh, property that the, the limiting graph inherits from the fact that you're, you started with finite graphs is unimodularity. So let me explain that. So the fact that the, the root has been chosen uniformly at random in your finite graph will confer a very strong stationary, stationarity property to the limiting graph, and that's called unimodularity. What does that mean? So if I look at a function that depends on the graph and two chosen vertices in that graph, and I sum over the second vertex, and I take an expectation over the law of this random graph, that's the same thing as if I took that sum but exchanged O and U in F. So what does that mean? If you think of, oops, uh, so this is true for f being positive. What does that mean if you look at the root O and you think of f of OU as being some amount of fluid that goes from O to U? And you then that's the, the sum on the left-hand side is the total amount of fluid or the total amount of mass that is sent out by U to all the vertices. So this identity says that that total amount of mass is preserved. The amount of mass that the root sends is the same thing as the amount of mass that the root receives. This is obviously true if the graph is finite just because in here, so this sum is finite and this expectation will be just an expectation over the choice of the root and the, the, the root has been chosen uniformly at random so you'll have a one over n sum over O and obviously all the sums are finite, you can just swap the sums and th this is true for finite graphs. It turns out that that property is closed under local weak convergence, so we keep inheriting it, you inherited it for, uh, for uh, uh, limits. Okay, and there is a fantastic paper by Aldous and Lyons that explains all of this. Okay, so the second uh, thing uh, that I mentioned in the theorem that I didn't define, which is amenability, and this is what you've expected. Infinite, an infinite rooted graph GO is anchored amenable, if it's anchored as a parametric constant is zero. So if you look at the infimum over all subsets that are finite and which contain the roots, the boundary over the volume goes to zero. Okay? It's not expanding, exactly. So for instance, the grid is amenable, and you've seen this because of the example that I gave you earlier. The tree is not, and any graph you can just look for yourself and see whether it is amenable or not. So it turns out that this is a classifying property for many processes on graphs. For instance, random works and percolation behave radically differently if the graph is amenable versus if it's not amenable. And you can see a book by Lines and Perez on this and more. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me talk about the marginals now that I've set up all my definitions. So the full marginals I want to approximate is, are the following. So this is just the probability that my variable at vertex u takes value x given all the information that I got in the graph. And I told you I'm trying to approximate it by this mu hat, which is just the, the, the posterior given uh, information in a uh, ball around the, the, the vertex u, and I'm throwing away all the other information. So just an equivalent theorem, actually a stronger theorem from which my previous theorem is a consequence, an easy consequence actually, is just under the same conditions that I told you that for almost every value of epsilon, then for a typical vertex, the total variation between 
new hat and new is goes to zero. Okay, so computing marginals is easy. Okay, let's try to prove this theorem. So so far I've set up the problem so that the proof becomes straightforward. So like we can just snap our fingers and prove it. So let's snap our fingers. So this is the marginal. Let me define a marginal on in the infinite graph since my graph converges. I can define a marginal over the infinite graph, which I can set up the same problem, uh, the same inference problem that I had, but on the infinite graph. So here I'm conditioning also on the knowledge of the rooted graph geo, okay? And I'm gonna prove two things. To prove my theorem, I can prove first that uh, this average converges to this quantity, expectation of mu squared, and this average, so here we have the local marginals, and here we have the full marginals and they converge to the same quantity. Since these two converge to the same quantity, it's a straightforward consequence to the justice just by Cauchy-Schwarz or whatever. Okay, the first statement is actually very easy. So local is a consequence of local weak convergence. There are no assumptions needed because just the, the, you can deduce it from the definition of local weak convergence. This is an event that is localized in a finite ball. And here I'm averaging over all vertices so you can see this as the root of GN chosen uniformly at random because uh, we have convergence in distribution. If you have local weak convergence, then this is, means that this should converge to this, that's it. This is just a definition, apply the definition. This is more challenging. So the lower bound is a straightforward consequence of local because you can easily see that this is greater than this. So this lean imp of this must be greater than this. This is just by Jensen because if I have more information, the second moment is larger, that's it. The upper bound is a statement about decay of point to set correlations. And that's where I'm gonna use amenability, I'm gonna use the fact that I have side information, okay? I think I'm gonna finish earlier. Okay, well, so let's let's talk about the upper bound. Turns out now, what did I do for the lower bound? Here's U, here's the entire graph. So for the lower bound, I just forgot about what happens outside this ball, and I just kept the information here, and I got a lower bound, right? Now what I can do is, keep this information and give you the exact value of the thetas on the boundary of this set. So if I give you theta, theta u for u, okay, I used u, this is v. On the boundary of this set, okay? That must be larger. By the Markov property of the model, if as soon as you give me all the values on the boundary, this becomes conditionally independent of this. So I can just drop this, and this is more information because I give you more information. So that will give you an upper bound, okay? So this is my upper bound. Now what I need is just to prove that this is equal to this, okay? And that's true for if the graph is amenable almost surely. So that's the main proposition. So how do you prove something like this? You have to prove that as the boundary recedes to infinity, so this is the boundary, giving me information at this boundary, theta, or let's say theta, del s, these two become approximately independent. So giving me that more information doesn't say anything, doesn't tell you anything as I'm talking to you. That's what that statement means. So that's really a statement about point, point, point to, decay of point to set correlations. So how do you prove something like this? Here's now really the result that powers the proof. It's, uh, I call it the magic lemma. Consider a, just an arbitrary graph G, it can be finite or infinite, and consider any set S, okay, finite set S, I guess. And all epsilon, if you look at the mutual information between the variable theta u and the theta del, del S, partial s at the boundary, given everything else, given the information that is inside that set s. And I sum over all vertices in s. That's bounded by the boundary. 
So here I'm summing over all the vertices in S, so we would expect that this should scale like the volume of S, but it doesn't. It scales like the boundary. So once you know this result, you're done. Okay? This is, okay, in the spin glass theory, this is called, okay. Similar results to this are called either epsilon symmetry, maybe also in physics it's also called replica symmetry. Some uh, very similar uh, lemmas are called pinion or cor correlation rounding, depending to who you speak. And Andrea proved something like this maybe a decade ago. That, that doesn't look like this form, but the, the techniques are very similar and the spirit of the result is very similar. Okay? So when you, once you know this, you can use amenability. Now if I divide by the volume of S and I get division here of surface over volume and that tends to zero, that tells me that the neutral information on average will go to zero between any randomly chosen points in the set U and the boundary. Now I can use unimodularity, the fact that the tr mass transport principle to, transform, to transport that information from an arbitrarily chosen vertex U to the root, okay? And that will give you this statement. So going from here to here is just a bunch of Pinsker inequalities and triangle inequalities and things like this. Yes, I mean the cardinality. Uh, yes, the alphabet size is finite. Yeah, I consider an alphabet size that is finite. That's right, that's right. Uh, no, no, they're not continuous. You can maybe discretize them if you want, but uh, the result holds for finite alphabets. Okay, so the, the once you know this lemma, then you can deduce this and then you can backtrack and show that now the limits are equal. These two limits are equal, hence you have this result. Are there any questions? So the way to prove this first is, I didn't put it on the slides, and just to let, give you any, some intuition. It's actually not intuitive at all, but <laughs> if you look at the Shannon entropy of this, giving the information in the set S, now take a derivative with respect to uh, epsilon of, of this quantity. Maybe take two derivatives. And that will be this term. That will be a sum over the mutual information. Now integrate, that's why you see that there is an integral over epsilon there. When you integrate, you get, you get a difference between some, some uh, Shannon entropy as you can drop one, use monotonicity of entropy when you enlarge the sets, and you'll see that at some point the entropy cannot be larger than the log of the alphabet size, that's where that logarithm comes from. And since you're considering the entropy of this boundary of this, that's just the log times the size of the number of variables here, that's it. And yeah, so, it's a, just a simple differentiation computation, but I don't understand it. I, can, I know how to prove it, but I don't understand it. So can you comment more on that? So somehow, you know, I'm more familiar with the correlation right. rounding style. Right, right, yeah. Where then, um, you know, a lot of times it's like the chain rule of mutual information That's showing right. up. That's Is right. that the thing that I should think of as surprising in this, the fact that it's not using subconditioning? Uh, well, it is using conditioning, right? It's right, but it's not uh, conditioning over larger and larger sets the way that yeah, no, you're not conditioned over a larger set. So by, by the way, here, so you're conditioning on a per number of variables that are proportional to the size of the set. The epsilon is fixed, right? Yeah. So you already have a very large set. That's not a problem. Uh, but uh, you, you do use uh, can, can the chain, uh, the, the okay, chain rule of thing. Over zero to epsilon in the epsilon prime, does it actually right, right. Right. Impossible? right, right. And the fact, okay, so we've seen in the result that the result holds for, ev for almost every epsilon. It comes just, just from the fact that I have to integrate. So it cannot hold for all epsilon, but it does hold for almost every epsilon because just because I'm integrating. If this quantity tends to zero, then this quantity in the integrand has to go to zero for almost every value. Uh, that's it. So just maybe to uh, elaborate more on your question, it's related to correlation rounding on pinning in a much more general sense. If you take any arbi an arbitrary distribution on a hypercube and you condition on a finite number of vertices, then this is true, or something like this should be true. 
and this is just the inference or the Bayesian version of that statement. Okay. Are there any questions? So the proof is over. Stokes theorem. Oh, I've never thought about that. Yeah. Uh, The area law, oh, I'm not very familiar with those type of arguments. I see, so there is, there's the, so okay, I, maybe I wasn't complete in my set of references. There is a, a result by Ma Nicolas Macris who proved something like this much earlier, like in the 2001 or something, yes. And it's true, it comes from information theory. When is the time? I, I do have time, I do have, yes. Right. So okay. So if you are, if you're trying to commute, can, can you can you repeat your question? Yeah. I didn't yeah, I fully uh, 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 digest it. Uh, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, on a, on a graph. And you're trying to compute the partition function. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, let's say right. Right. Yes, yeah, that's the same thing. It's the same thing, yeah. You can see it also from a cavity computation. When you try to compute, when you try to compute your partition function, at some point you have to compute certain conditional marginals, and those, if you restrict to a smaller sets, then doesn't change much, and then you get a, an approximation of the free energy, yeah, okay. So let me comment on a counterexample. So this theorem cannot hold in full generality. If you drop the amenability condition, then that becomes false. Of course, so the non amenable case, or the prototypical one, is the random regular graph, or at least asymptotically amenable, because reg random regular graph converges to the tree. And I'm going to consider ZQ synchronization. And uh, let me remind you what ZQ is. Oh, here it is. Uh, for every pair of vertices uh, that are connected by an edge, I observe the difference, modulo Q. And uh, otherwise, with probably 1 minus B, and otherwise, I receive noise. Okay, so this problem has been considered by Singer initially, not necessarily for ZQ, but for general groups, continuous groups. And it was considered in a series of works later. This one in particular studies, studies it on a lattice, and that's really interesting, and there are many open problems there. So here, here's the, the theorem. If you consider this uh, channel over the random regular graph, then there is a gap. You can't have, you can't possibly uh, compute the marginals for all values of this, the signal to noise ratio. That's not possible and efficient. So there is an exhaustive search procedure that you can define and it's defined in the paper that will succeed with high probability if this value, so this is the effective SNR, it's the degree of the graph times one minus P squared and one minus P is the probability of getting the right information is larger than log Q over Q, then this will succeed. So we can take this as being the information theoretic threshold and on the other hand, the local marginals that I defined will, that won't tell you anything about the, the, the solution. They stay uniform unless D times one of the same quantity approximately is bigger than one. So there is this gap between log Q over Q up to one where you don't know how to compute uh, things efficiently. And this is called in the literature, it's called the kasten stegen threshold. And yeah, so not only the local marginals do not work, but no local algorithm will work. And the, you, can the, the, you can deduce that just because the local algorithm that I'm considering is the base optimal one. And it turns out that even non-local algorithms fail, or at least the ones that we know cannot compute the marginals or do inference in this regime, in this intermediate regime. So the result that I, uh, that I talked about cannot possibly be true in ge full generality. So it seems like amenability is a really crucial assumption. Okay, so how do you prove these things? These are more or less standard techniques. Uh, this relies on the first moment computation. 
that is similar to uh, a paper or a technique that has been developed in Dendo, Montanari, and Sun. And the second result just relies on the fact that when you have a tree, the tree is self-similar and you can uh, analyze the recursive distributional equations that is satisfied by the belief propagation algorithm. And the analysis is similar to something that Alan Sly did or Janssen and Mosser did. So these are more or less standard uh, results that you can look up in the literature. Okay. Okay, so I'm concluding. So the key points are, so if you have to keep a message with you in mind is that isoparametry is, uh, has an impact, has an important impact on the tractability of inference in graphical models. If you look at your graphical model of choice and you look and you see that it looks more like a grid than it looks like a random graph, then you can know that uh, inference is easy. Okay, and moreover, not only they're tractable, but they're tractable with a local algorithm. That's what I showed you. Now, there is one question or two questions that popped up in my mind and I don't know the solution. Is So in the opposite end of the spectrum, when you have non-amenable graphs, can you classify the tractability of inference? Now, that seems to be the wild west. We don't know what happens. It's just a disorganized mess so far. For certain problems, we know how to compute things optimally. For other problems, we know there's a gap. And we don't have any, we don't have any criterion that will just separate the ones, the problems we know how to compute and from the ones that we don't know how to compute efficiently. Okay, so this has to be a joint condition on the graph and the kernel that you're using. Otherwise, that, I mean, there are counterexamples otherwise. Okay, the second question is how to weaken the side information model. So if I, maybe you can see that as a very strong assumption to receive the value, the exact value of the variable with probability epsilon for every vertex. Uh, can you weaken that assumption? In particular, so okay, so this, uh, I don't think this is possible in the full general setting that I discussed. Maybe you have to put more assumptions. And let's say just consider the easing model on the, the, the grid. And I don't give you side in info, can you do anything? So the paper, this paper, achieves that question, or answers that question partially. And they say basically you can't do optimal, okay, they don't know how to do optimal estimation or optimal recovery, but they do it in a partial regime that is very, very close to one, so when p is extremely small, extremely small, like one over two to the 40 or something like that, then they have an algorithm that works. But so there is a phase transition that is more or less very well understood in p, so in two dimensions, p would be like zero, six, two, three, something like this. And we don't know how to do it efficiently up to that point. So that would be a very interesting question. That will require ideas that are like very different. So, uh, okay, thank you. Right, so I didn't assume I have any quantitative bound on how fast the boundary over volume goes, but if you do have an assumption like that, maybe you can extract some rates, but they're not gonna be optimal, so I just didn't attempt. Um, yeah, this argument is extremely soft. I have an integral over epsilon get that goes to zero, so the, inter the integrand has to go to zero for almost every value, but I have no control over how, how fast that goes to zero. So you need something more quantitative and it doesn't seem to be the case that we know how to do this so far in the general. Uh, for the mean field case, so uh, I'm not sure. Uh, they're similar, but no, they're not. They're like the optimal rates are not known in that, even in that case, they, they're not known. So if I consider a very simple model that is mean field, like I consider Spike's Wigner model, the G, Spike GOE, I know how to get the optimal rates, but for very different reasons, because I know how to do cavities. Like I, I know how to compute cavities. Here. Remind me what an FP test is. So you want that if you, your running time goes only. Ah, uh, fully polynomial. Yeah. That's what it means. That's, that's what it <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, you have to give me specific examples of graphs. I mean, otherwise I can't tell you anything. Like the, 
the, for instance, if you're at, at the roots and the degree of the roots grows at some rates, then like how do you how do you control that? Like I didn't assume anything. So on the tree, you can do computations easily because you know what the tree is. On the lattice, you can do computations easily for other different reasons because the terminal structure, the you know the partition function has a certain form, etc. But for general graphs, I have no idea. That's true, that's true, yeah. Well, that's, that's an argument in my favor, <laughs> yes. 